Welcome to my channel Heart Meets Spirit. This channel is intended to support you improving and changing your life. Live a life of love, trust and confidence. Enjoy. You know, I, I, I believe in human possibility, human potential, and I think that one of our biggest limiting beliefs is the belief of how limited we really are. And so my interest is to give people the science to begin to understand how powerful they really are. And I think that science really is the language that does that really well. And, and the new sciences like quantum physics and uh, neuroplasticity, neuroscience, neuroendocrinology, you know, uh, psychoneuroimmunology, the mind-body connection, epigenetics, all of those sciences point the finger at possibility. So I want to create a language for people from a philosophical or theoretical standpoint for them to begin to understand what's possible. But then I want to be able to have those people begin to wire that information in their brain completely because learning is making new connections, right, in the brain. But remembering is maintaining and sustaining those connections and it's so much easier to lose our vision than to remember it, right? So then we have to begin to hardwire the brain or install the neurological hardware in preparation for an experience. So the more people understand what they're doing and why, then the how gets easier. So I want to then set up the conditions in an environment, in a, in, a, in a workshop where people can begin to apply or personalize what they learn so that they can have an experience. An experience then further enriches the brain. But the prize of an experience is an emotion. And once you start feeling unlimited, once you start feeling abundant, once you start feeling worthy, Now you're teaching your body chemically to understand what your mind is intellectually understood. So knowledge is for the mind and experience is for the body and people begin to embody the truth, of that philosophy. Now if they can repeat it over and over again, it'll become innate in them, it'll become natural, second nature, it'll become easy, they begin to master that philosophy. So I want people to begin to understand that thoughts are very powerful, feelings drive our thoughts and that they can begin to create a better life for themselves once they understand some of these principles. Yeah, and we hear this a lot, and I've heard you say that we sign up to become victims of our own life. Mm. Uh, explain what that means and, and how do we start <clears throat> shifting that away and what the alternative is. I think there's degrees of understanding this, Jay, because uh, people use the word victim so much and I don't really think uh, we spend a lot of time really unraveling the idea. but. If I said to you, Jay, how are you doing today? And you said, well, I'm really upset because of this person or this circumstance or this condition in my life, then what we're saying, this is not conscious. This is an unconscious program. What we're saying is somebody out there is actually controlling the way I'm feeling and the way that I'm thinking. So if something out there is controlling your feelings and your thoughts, your victim to whoever, whatever that is. Now, here's the challenge. The challenge is when things go really well, then you are feeling really good. But when things aren't going very well, then you're feeling pretty bad. So then the end result of that is that many people then become unconsciously reliant on something out there to change how they feel in here. But if they don't understand that they're creating reality all the time and they're living in lack, in unworthiness, in separation for their whole entire life, waiting for the event to happen to take away their lack or emptiness, well, they'll spend their whole entire life wishing, wanting, waiting, hoping. And so then that creates further separation from things changing. So then the idea then is to turn that battleship around. Is it possible then that the way you think and the way you feel can begin to produce effects in your outer world? Now, that isn't something that you swallow in one bite. It's a process of gaining knowledge. It's a process of practice. It's a process of experience. But once you start seeing those synchronicities, those coincidences, those opportunities that start to fall into place because you're experiencing change in your outer world, If you're doing the work, you're going to start paying attention to what you're doing inside of you that's producing the effect outside of you. 
And once you correlate the changes of what you're doing inside of you with the effect you produce outside of you, you're going to pay attention to what you did and you're going to do it again. And all of a sudden, you're going to start believing more that you're the creator of your life and less of the victim of your life. So if your thoughts and feelings somehow have an effect on your outer world, and you're reacting to the same people at the same place at the same time in the same circumstances, then you're actually reaffirming the same reality because you're thinking equal to everything that you know. So that in order to change that, we have to begin to be greater than our environment. And being is how we think and feel. So when people begin to practice this, they're not so quick to give their power away to the person or condition in their life because the stronger the emotion you feel from some problem or condition in your life, the more altered you feel inside of you, the more you pay attention to the cause. Well, where you place your attention is where you place your energy. So you're giving your life force, you're giving your energy away to that person or problem that you could be using to heal, that you could be using to create a new future. So then teaching people then how to self-regulate and find the present moment and settle their body down from those unconscious programs or those emotions that they're conditioned to. That's the work. Mm. And so then when you start lowering the volume to those emotions and you're doing the work and mastering yourself in some way, as you begin to change your emotional state, you're not going to be thinking about that person or problem and you're going to begin to take your power back. And it literally begins to build a person's own electromagnetic field. Now, they have energy to heal. They have energy to create a new future. That's amazing. And before we dive into that, I, I want to ask you this, because we were just speaking about this earlier, that 10 to 15 years ago, a lot of people would have struggled with these ideas and it took a bit of pushing, but now people are coming to the events that you're doing a lot more open. You know, all of these themes and topics are becoming more broader conversation. People are hearing about these ideas. Tell me if there are still any people who are skeptical listening or if there's anyone listening and just like, yeah, I've kind of heard about this thought thing before, but like share with us some some examples of how you've seen this transform some of the biggest things in people's lives. Well, first of all, um, 15, 20 years ago, um, everybody wanted to stay in the philosophical realm. Nobody wanted to do anything. But this is, this is a time in history where it's not enough to know. This is a time in history to know how. Because information is so available, right? I mean, you don't need a doctor, you don't need a priest, you don't need a rabbi, you don't need a governor, you don't need a teacher to gain information, you don't need an authority any longer. Because of technology, we have access to information. Well, information creates awareness. And awareness is consciousness. And you can't have consciousness without energy. So people are beginning to wake up with a greater level of awareness of what's possible. So. 15 years ago, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, I walked out and there was always a little resistance. But now people are coming because they want to actually experience the truth of it. So that makes my job easier because I can just walk out and just fire away because people are prepared, they're informed, they're ready. So anything that's not consistent with that energy or that level of awareness, those paradigms are beginning to break down whether it's education, whether it's religion, whether it's politics, economics, the environment, the medical model, everything's collapsing because people are informed. So I love that idea because when people show up and they say, well, listen, uh, I understand that I have a health condition. I understand that it's taken me 10 years of being unhappy, 10 years of living in stress, 10 years of living in fear that's actually begin to signal or select and instruct the gene that creates the disease. Well, it may take me some time then to unlearn that process, to break that conditioning process. So there's a practical understanding now. But something amazing has happened. I mean, we've spent over 10 years doing very advanced scientific studies. We've done over 8,500 brain scans. We've measured so many thousands of hearts because if you're going to create a new future 
it requires a clear intention and elevated emotion. Well, let's train our people how to create really, really high level brain coherence and really, really, really self regulating heart coherence. Why? Because if you're going to believe in that future that you're creating with all of your heart, it better be opened and activated, and you better know how to do that, and you better understand the science of what happens. We've measured a gene regulation, 7,500 different gene regulations. We know you can change your gene expression in four days. We've measured it. You're not, you're not doomed by your genes. You're your own genetic engineer that, that um, you can lengthen your life. And uh, we've seen telomeres actually lengthen 60 days of meditation that you, you add days to your life. You're changing your genetic future that you can strengthen your immune system by thought alone. That's, that's, the, that's the evidence from the scientific perspective and people love the evidence because they start to see that's possible. You're not gonna find that in a pharmaceutical commercial. You're not gonna find that out there in the world. You gotta really be hungry and look for it. So then that sets the stage for the person to come and want to have that experience. There may not be so quick to say, hey, I wanna heal my body right away. They may say, I need to get my brain and heart coherent first. And I gotta begin to put my effort into learning how to do this, like learning any skill. Then you have testimony, which is people with stage four cancers, people that are blind, that are seeing, people that are deaf, that are hearing, people with tumors on their thyroid, people with Parkinson's disease, with, with myasthenia gravis, with, with MS, with rare genetic disorders uh, that medical science had no solution for, that, 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 that struggled with all the conventional approaches and got absolutely nowhere and then started doing this work, and now they're standing on the stage in front of a thousand people and saying, yeah, I had uh, stage four cancer. Uh, I did all the treatments, I did the chemotherapy, I've been getting worse, I stopped doing everything and I started doing this work, and uh, it took me six weeks, I just came from my doctor, and there's no evidence of cancer. There's no, on the scans, on the blood tests, my doctors wanna know what I'm doing. And you know, this, the patient says, well, I'm down-regulating down genes for disease and I'm up-regulating genes for health. Doctors are scratching their heads saying, what do you mean? So now you have evidence in testimony and evidence is the loudest voice. So just like um, a disease spreads amongst the community, you know, and, and alters, I think that health and wellness can be as infectious as disease. And so the person in the audience who's looking at the person with stage four cancer and, this, and the person's telling their story, and it's not glamorous. And it's not a Hollywood version. This is real. They lost everything. They went bankrupt. They lost their friends. They lost certain things in their life. But they were persistent. And that person is the example of truth. And it's undeniable. Or the person who had a stroke and is blind. The doctor said, your vision's going to get worse. And she has a transcendental moment, and she can see again. like. That doesn't happen a year later after you've had a stroke. And then, you know, people having all of these transcendental changes that are going on, I think now that what's happening is, I, I'm more surprised at this point than anybody because I never thought uh, how far this could go, right? So, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm super happy, I'm overjoyed with, with what's taking place. And um, I think we've kind of pierced that four minute mile, like, you know, mm. once you break that veneer, right, in consciousness, uh, then other people can do it. And I think there's strong footprints in consciousness in the quantum field. I think there's evidence in three dimensional reality. And it's, a, it's an important time for us to wake up to our own personal uh, abilities. Absolutely. No, I love that. And thank you for sharing that. It's, it's incredible, some of the work that you've done. And the people's lives that have been transformed. And what I want to get into now is that really practical aspect of like breaking that pattern, mm. right? Because that's where most of us are. We have that negative self-talk. We have the victim mindset. We have the, I'm busy. I've got too much going on. I am overwhelmed. I'm experiencing anxiety. It's that person at work. It's my partner. Like we have that. That's reality of where we are today. Yeah. How do we break that pattern in a way that actually makes a difference and is easy enough as a starting point? Yeah, it, it's been said that you should meditate for 20 minutes a day, unless you're really busy, then you should meditate for an hour a day. Yeah, I love that. I love, that's why, by the way, that's why I meditate for two hours a day. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so look, I mean, um, 
information is what opens that door. I mean, if you think that your thoughts have something to do with your future, just from a theoretical standpoint, that your thoughts create your destiny, and you think 60 to 70,000 thoughts in one day, and 90% of those thoughts are the same thoughts as the day before, well, then your life isn't going to change very much as long as you're thinking the same way. And it, those, those same thoughts lead to the same choices. The same choices lead to the same behaviors. The same behaviors create the exact same experiences, and we anticipate the same feelings or emotions from those experiences, and those emotions are the payoff that drive our very same thoughts. Well, our biology, our neurocircuitry, our neurochemistry, our hormones, and even our gene expression will be equal to how we think, how we act, and how we feel. And how we think, how we act, and how we feel is called our personality. And our personality creates our personal reality. That's it. So the present personality who's listening to this show has created the present personal reality called their life. So if you can latch on to this idea, if you want to create a new life, a new personal reality, you got to change your personality, which means you better start thinking about what you've been thinking about and changing it. You begin to become conscious of your unconscious actions or habits or behaviors and modify them. And then we have to begin to look at the emotions that we live by every single day that are keep us connected to the past and decide, do these emotions belong in our future? So most people are trying to create a new personal reality as the same personality and it doesn't work. You literally have to become someone else. So the principle in neuroscience says that nerve cells that fire together, wire together. You keep thinking the same way, making the same choices, demonstrating the same habits, uh, creating the same experiences that stamp the same networks of neurons into the same patterns, all for the familiar feeling called you. And you do that for 10 years on end. You're going to begin to hardwire certain patterns in your brain that becomes your identity. And by the time we're 35 years old, it kind of becomes fixed, right? And psychology used to say that you can't change that, but we now know that you can. So then that kind of box in the brain, that is the habit of ourselves. It's a, uh, we're 95% of the time running a series of programs. So then sitting and doing the work, we have to become disentangled from those programs. And so the moment you decide to do something differently or make a new choice, what most people don't want to face is that discomfort. And that, that discomfort, that, that uncertainty, that lack of predictability, the, that, that, that unknown is what people are afraid of because they'd rather live in guilt. At least they can predict who they're going to be than take a chance in possibility. So when a person begins to understand this and you say, well, how long have you been this way? And they say, I've been like this for 35 years. And you say, why 35 years? Because 35 years ago, I had this one event. Well, the stronger the emotion you feel from reaction from that event, the more altered you feel inside of you, the more the brain narrows its focus and freezes the image and takes a snapshot. And that's called a memory, right? So then forget the memory just overcome the emotion because it's the emotion that keeps you anchored to the past so that sounds really good theoretically but when you step out into that unknown into that void the body really is in a habit and when a habit is when the body becomes the mind or if you're thinking about that past event and it's producing an emotion well, you need an image and a feeling to start the conditioning process so the body's either conditioned into the familiar past or it's hardwired in the predictable future because it wakes up every single day and runs through the same series of routine actions. So the present moment then becomes the unknown. When people start feeling that discomfort, Jay, they'd rather get on their cell phone and call someone or get up and say, I can't meditate or, you know, I, I have too much to do. They excuse themselves. They return back into that familiar feeling because the body's actually telling the brain a habit is when the body becomes the mind. So the body stepping out into the unknown and says, ooh, I'd rather feel guilty. I'd rather feel unhappy than be in this discomfort. So then at least then when they return back to that familiar feeling, then they feel safe. So they step out in the unknown and the body starts influencing the mind saying, you can start tomorrow. You're too busy. It's your mother's fault. You know, it's your culture's fault. I don't have enough money. This isn't going to work. 
those are the programs in there that are standing in the way between you and your future. So then nerve cells that no longer fire together, no longer wire together. So the act of observing those states of mind and body means you're no longer the program. You're the consciousness observing that program. So, so then to meditate, it means to become familiar with. So as you become familiar with those thoughts, you become conscious of how you speak, you become aware of how you act, you notice how you're feeling, the more conscious you become of those unconscious programs, the less unconscious you'll go in your waking day. Why? Because it's not enough to just have a great meditation and get up and get on the freeway and get in traffic and getting stressed. You just return back to the old self again. Our job then is to sustain that modified state of mind and body the entire day. And if you can, get ready because something different or unusual is going to begin to happen in your life. And it will come as a coincidence or a synchronicity. And that's breadcrumbs from the divine saying, you're on the path, just keep doing it. You're, there'll be another one, just keep staying in that energy. And so teaching people then to understand that there's a formula that we now know that if you apply that formula, you'll begin to see those changes. And now, as people are doing it more and more uh, effectively, the results are going up as well. We just had Bond University. They just took a whole bunch of my brain scans from 10 years ago. Huge clinical study, a lot of analysis, and, and they're blown away by the speed in which uh, the community can change brain and heart coherence they they know how to do it it's not uh something that's that's separate from them they've practiced it enough times that they they now know how to do it so what's the significance of that well really simple in your life if you start returning back to the same reactions to the same people and circumstances you're returning back to the old self so you got to stay conscious in your life and and if you're not being defined by a vision of the future then you're left with the memories of the past and you will be predictable in your life so crossing that river of change from the old self to the new self there's a neurological a biological a chemical a hormonal a genetic death of the old self but if you teach people there's something on the other side they won't give up on themselves they'll keep going so there's enough evidence to encourage people and you can't tell me you're too old to do this work you can't tell me you're too sick to do this work you can't tell me you had a turbulent past or or that you're too overweight or too underweight or too out of shape or you can't even tell me that you've never meditated before in fact some of our greatest scans are people who just have never meditated before that are not trying to do anything they just follow instructions so our community now is beginning to understand that it is possible and they go all in not 50 percent in not 60 percent in if we do a week-long event we got a thousand people or 1500 people and they are all in and that when they start getting beyond themselves that first day or second day once they start getting beyond themselves and that magic starts to happen then i have no idea i can't predict what's going to happen next and it's usually pretty pretty exciting it's been said that when the pain of staying the same outweighs the pain of change, then we will change. Yes, exactly. Right? How bad it, does it have to get? Yeah, exactly. And it's like, why Why is it that we get so attached to that old self? Like, what is it about it? Is it security? Is it safety? Is it familiarity, as you said? Is it, what is that that keeps us so attached and so focused on something that we don't even like that much? I think, uh, I think we've been hypnotized and conditioned into becoming materialists. Mm. I think... Um, that we define reality with our senses. And I think that is one of the biggest delusions. So the fundamental question is, can you believe in a future that you can't see or experience with your senses yet, but you've thought about enough times in your mind mm. that your brain has literally changed to look like the event has already occurred? Now, the latest research in plasticity says that's absolutely possible. And can you select a new possibility in the quantum field? and begin to emotionally embrace that future every single day to such a degree that your body, as the unconscious mind, the objective mind does not know the difference between the experience in your life that's creating the emotion and the emotion that you're fabricating by thought alone to the degree that you begin to signal new genes and new ways to change your body 
to look like the experience has already happened. Now, yes. the latest research in epigenetics says it's absolutely possible. Now think about this. Every day, installing the circuitry, every day conditioning the body into the emotion of the future, that your body begins to change to look like it's already happened. Now this is where it gets fun because now you no longer have to go anywhere to get it. Now it begins to come to you. You become the vortex or the magnet to your destiny. So then people who come out of their meditation and they say, well, I just focused on my wealth. Why isn't it there? Well, you're not that good. If you're asking why isn't it there, you're back to the old person again. Stay in that state for an extended period of time as an experiment, as the scientist in your life to keep your energy connected to the to the dream of your future and then see what kind of effects begin to take place without moving into impatience, mm. without moving into frustration, without starting to analyze why it hasn't happened or when. That is the trap of defining reality with your senses. So you have the thought of your future and you don't see it, then you experience separation. But people who are practicing this work, they have the thought of their future and they feel the emotion of their future. They're still connected to it, right? Mm -hmm. So that takes practice. And it's just learning, like hitting a golf ball, hitting a tennis ball, dancing the salsa, you know, crocheting, whatever it is. You gotta, you gotta start out staying real conscious and learning. Then you get good at it and it gets to be instrumental. It gets to be fun. And that's, that's what I want for everybody, that the, the act of creation should be a blissful, Playful. ecstatic, loose, uh, free process. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so I love the idea of people taking time out of their lives uh, to prove to themselves that if they're defined by the vision of the future, then they're not living by the memories of the past. And that's where the unknown exists. So many people, the unknown is a scary place. So they don't see that future because they're used to seeing that future with evidence, with their senses. And the, you have to be able to get beyond that and stay in the unknown, stay in that discomfort. And then in that moment, to be, begin to self-regulate. Like, oh, I'm starting to feel a little anxiety. Ooh, I'm starting to feel a little frustration. That's the defining moment where your body's going back to the past because emotions are a record of the past. Or you go into routine again. So you catch yourself. It's a victory. And if you keep catching yourself, those victories add up. And it's not so much about your wealth or your health or your freedom or your new relationship. It's actually about who you become. And so overcoming the old self allows us to become somebody else. And there is that period of transition. Yeah. I call it the void where there's just not a lot happening. And you just got to be able yeah. to keep going and continuously get to the end of your belief where most people stop. I just had a fabulous conversation with someone uh, this weekend. Broke through to the other side and now there's so much magic happening around this person. But she's worthy now to receive it. And that's, that, that is the key because the universe only gives us what we think we're worthy of receiving. So we got to come initiated into this and understand it. Thousands of years of programming that says that we have to change things uh, matter to matter, mm. you know, in three-dimensional reality. And it will take time. But to begin to connect to that resource called the quantum field and create from the field instead of from matter, there's a lot of unlearning that has to go on. Absolutely. And when you're catching yourself... What are you doing? Are you writing that down? Are you noting that down? Are you making a mental note? Like, practically, what is someone having to do to, once they catch it, then how, how do you deal with that emotion and anxiety in the moment that feels so heavy, that yeah. feels so- Real. Real and <laughs> trapping. And, and like you said, I was just at, I was at the Facebook headquarters in Menlo Park a couple of weeks ago. I was testing out their new Oculus mm -hmm. range of virtual reality. And all the studies behind virtual reality show now that you feel the same experience of hanging off the edge of a cliff in virtual reality yeah. and your body displays the same symptoms as they would if you were actually hanging off a cliff. Yeah, yeah. So just showing how imagination does mirror the other way too through virtual reality. But how that feels so real. Like yeah. our body gets, when you're stepping out off the ledge, you're doing mm -hmm. it as if it's reality. Mm -hmm. And so that anxiety feels so real. What do you do after catching it? What happens to that emotion? Well, you know, just like anything else, Jay, I mean, 
it's just like hitting a golf ball and you get back into a bad habit again, you know? You have to really begin to mentally rehearse. Mm. Like, so you ask yourself at the end of your day, I do this every day, how'd I do? How'd I do today, bro? How'd you do? Did you do good? Where'd you fall from grace? What, what, what was it that caused you to go unconscious f- for the rest of the day? Like, what was that moment? Now, if you're a student of life, you'll begin to contemplate, well, it was that person that said that thing, then I reacted, or this, I got this email, or things didn't go my way, and I started feeling angry or frustrated or fearful. The next time that happens, how could I evolve my experience? Now, you may have to search for some answers of the best model to build, or you may actually have a long contemplation and start to go, God, the next time that happens, I think I'm going to do this, or I'm going to do that, or I'm going to plan my behaviors. And the act of closing your eyes and rehearsing what you're going to do begins to install the neurological hardware in your brain to look like you already did it. Now the brain is no longer a record of the past. Now it's a map to the future. And if you keep installing that hardware, the hardware will become a software program, which means you'll just start acting like a happy person. Why? There's no magic there. You installed the circuitry. So that's more important than the news. Right. It's more important than answering any email or any text. It's more important than talking about your past or some dinner. If you can begin to just think about how you're going to do it differently, that's the building process neurologically already. So now you have to get conscious in order to do that. And it takes some time. It means you got to shut your cell phone off. You got to close your door. You got to take a break from everything out there and begin to practice. And so by experience then, you start noticing, oh, here it comes. Here comes the frustration. Here comes the fear. And now we've given people the tools to be able to self-regulate, yes. to create brain and heart coherence. And so you see people say, excuse me one minute, I just need a minute. They take some breaths, they get back in, they connect to the energy of their future. This is incidental compared to where they're going. So they don't fall from grace. They don't allow their energy to drop. And so, yeah, in the beginning, it takes a lot because yeah. it takes a lot of energy and awareness to stay conscious and not go unconscious. But if you're persistent and you're determined and you're sincere, you begin to figure it out. You begin to say, I am not going to give my power away to that person or that circumstance when I can use it to heal or to create a new future. And so people then won't excuse themselves and say, I had a hard day yesterday, I had a fight with my coworker or my ex, or, and I don't feel like doing the work. Well, that's the time to get back on the horse. Yeah. Because because it's the it's all of those times that we self-correct mm. those are the most valuable moments thus people who've had profoundly transcendental experiences where they we say got lit up they connected and their brain goes into very very high coherent states and super gamma patterns that are way outside of normal and they have a transcendental download or connection that's mystical they look back at their entire life They don't want to change one thing in their past because it got them to that moment. That's the moment the past no longer exists. Now, by the same means, they look back at their past and they see all those tough moments where they overcame themselves and they fall in love with that person. They don't look at the good meditations or the things that went well. They look, they know that it was those moments that got them to this moment. And I I think then that's when they begin to understand that that all of the hard work, all the effort in who we become makes, uh, no one can take that away from us. So then once we arrive at that level and we experience whatever the dream is or whatever we create, the next thing is is do it until you fully enjoy it. And then when it gets boring or predictable, let's go again. Let's do something else. And I think that's evolution. Yeah, absolutely. And it's it's the day you don't want to is the day you most need to. Exactly. And and I think what you said about self-correction there and mental rehearsal is such powerful points because I think it's, I always say this, like warriors prepare not on the battlefield, right? Like you don't prepare when someone's yeah. about to slice you with their, yeah. with their blade. Like you prepare in your quarters. You prepare 
uh, in the training camp. And, mm -hmm. and I think for a lot of us, we wait till things go bad or we wait for that moment where we're feeling pain or stress or anxiety and then go, okay, what do I do? Where's the pills or where's this or where's this? And then we look for our toolkit. Yeah. But it's that preparation of that toolkit. And now let's let's break some of the myths around this visioning of the future that you're speaking mm -hmm. about because we hear it so often and, and I'm intrigued to see which, which way you answer it. But I feel like we live in a world where often when people think about visioning the future, they vision stuff. So you have a vision of the car you want or you have a vision of an amount of money you want or you have a vision of a home you want and you see this with people with their vision boards. Mm -hmm. What's your take on that? And is that the right type of visioning? And what is the right type of visioning? Well, we do so many different variations because I think people integrate information differently. Mm. And all of those cars and homes and whatever that is, there are symbols of what it looks like when a person actually arrives at this concept called abundance, right? Mm. So if those things help them to associate with something that creates a feeling mm -hmm. of abundance and they're building their vision board to help them to get clear on their intent, then that's fine because they're associating objects or things or material things that they'll say, that's when I know that I'm abundant. That's fine. Uh, other people will say, look, abundance just means that I have more than I need. And I'm happy with that. And for them, there's a feeling that is associated with that. And when they begin to dream about their future, they may see themselves in a scene or see themselves a certain way. I don't care what it takes for the person to get there because once they have their abundance, and this happens quite a bit in our work, when you finally have everything you want, there's only one thing you're going to ask yourself, how am I going to contribute to the world? Mm -hmm. How am I going to make a difference? So we use different tools to help people to get to that point. But if the person's doing the vision board and they're saying, when I get my new car, I get my new house, I get my new relationship, then I'm going to feel so great. Now, well, then they're back to the program waiting yeah. for it to happen for them to feel the emotion. They're, they're believing their outer world has to change in order for them to feel better. There's, there's no effect of drawing the experience to you with that way. So the person has to use those tools to get them into the emotional state for them to feel like it's already happened. Now think about this. If you get up from a creative process and you feel grateful, you feel a love for life, you feel a joy for existence, you feel a passion uh, to, for the moment, uh, you will not be looking for your future because you'll feel like it's already happened. Mm. It's the moment that we start feeling those self-limiting emotions that we feel separation, and then we start looking for it again. Well then, if you're waiting, you're not creating, you're, you're in separation again. <laughs> so, then, yeah. so then, whatever it takes for you to move into a state of being, and what is a state of being? Thoughts are the vocabulary of the brain. Feelings are the vocabulary of your body. How you think and how you feel creates your state of being. So then if you wake up in the morning and you come, come back to your senses with a clean slate and you say, I don't feel anything, you say, well, let me start thinking about all the problems in my life. Well, all those problems are connected to different people or different objects or things at different times and places. The moment you remember your problems, a memory is a record of the past. You're thinking in the past. Every one of those problems has an emotion associated with it. So all of a sudden you start feeling unhappy, you start feeling bitter, you start feeling frustrated. So now your body's in the past. So then most people then create a state of being that's connected to their past. And if they're in the familiar past, then they are going to crave the predictable future and they're going to fall back into routine. Mm -hmm. So then we want people then to get very clear on that vision of their future, however they do it and begin to combine that clear intention with an elevated emotion. And the stronger the emotion they feel from the vision they're creating, the more altered they feel inside of them, the more they're gonna pay attention to the pictures in their mind. And now they're remembering their future. And biologically, 
it's exactly the same as remembering your past. In fact, if you're not being defined by a vision in the future, it means you're making your past more real than your future. Mm -hmm. You're falling in love with your past. You're more in love with your past than you are with your future. That you're believing in your past more than you're believing in your future. When you get to that moment where you have that feeling, that's your compass because that feeling is going to drive your behaviors. It's gonna drive more of those thoughts. And when you feel that feeling and it's visceral, no person, no thing, no experience will stand in the way between you and that vision. And, and you will be initiated in, by the universe into wealth. You will be initiated into health. You'll be initiated into freedom. Those people, all those people that have healed themselves of all those different health conditions, they are so humble and so happy and they feel so great that they would never trade this feeling because of what you thought of them. They, they, they've, they've left that program behind a long time ago. They actually don't care how you think of them. They, they actually are so happy with themselves that they are no longer dependent on anything outside of them. Now, I think that's a really important moment because that's the moment we give people permission in our lives to do the same, right? And, I think that more and more people are beginning to figure that out uh, as they do this work. Absolutely, yeah, and I love that. I, I often say that if you're always if you're always waiting for happiness, then you're not creating your happiness, and yeah. you said the wait and create. And I I really think that that's such a powerful message. And let that, whoever's listening or watching right now, like let that really sit with you because if you're always waiting, if you're always postponing, if you're always delaying, if you're always expecting, again, like you said, an external thing to change your internal reality then you're again back at sure. back at level one. Yeah, and look, I mean, we're in a, we're in a convenience-based society. I mean, if you, if you lose your internet connection or your cell phone doesn't do what it's supposed to, people get angry. Like, yeah. that's 20 seconds, right? So here you are creating something out of nothing and you don't have the patience. Yeah. Well, that has to come out because a very, very masterful person who is abundant had to own impatience yeah. so then never make it be about the end result make it be about effort mm. every day you're overcoming every day you're out of the bleachers and you're on the field and you're giving it your all and you're practicing keeping your energy up greater than your habits in your <laughs> body or the emotional conditioning of your body greater than any circumstance in your environment mm. and sustaining it for an extended period of time and then all of a sudden when you're connected to the energy of your future mm. and you know what that feels like, yeah. you will know the moment you return back to the energy of your past. And if you tell me it's because of your boss or your coworker or your ex, I'm going to say, oh, <laughs> you're back to the unconscious program that yeah. you're the victim of your life, right? Absolutely. So then, so then it, it takes some unlearning and the, the unlearning process is the most important process because once you do that, you're clearing out room for the next creation to be easier and the next one to be easier because you're starting to understand the formula a little better and you start saying, I'm not going to take that personally or I'm not going to react or I'm not going to go back to that person again. I'm just going to self-regulate again. Yeah. You only need a few experiences to know that this is the truth and then you start making, you start managing your attention and you manage your energy a lot better. And I think that, I, I, I always say, I don't care that you fall off the horse. I just care when you get back on, right? Mm -hmm. Because some people fall off and then they have to go into guilt and analysis and, and they take weeks. And well, you could have just said, eh, I fell off. Let me just get back on and keep going here. Yeah. I've, I've heard you say that people use their, and I talk a lot about relationships in a lot of my content. My audience likes learning about relationships. They're obviously such a big part of our life. I've heard you say that we use relationships as a mechanism for our addictions to certain emotions. Yeah, uh, and and tell me how we do that and and how to snap out of that because I think sometimes we're kind of like okay, well, you know, I'm not doing it, but you're, you're using someone else as your your crutch. Well, look, I mean, I think that emotions are energy in motion, mm -hmm. and so let's just say that um, we share the same experiences. Okay, I don't. We're friends, and we share the same experience. Oh, you're from London. I've been to London. My daughter lives in London, and we have. Hey, you do this. I do that. You did that. You know. You own this. I own that. You know. So what we do is we actually look to see when we meet people, 
if we're matching neurologically or if we're matching emotionally. So if we share the same experiences, we share the same emotions. And if we share the same emotions, we can relate to one another. So this is where it gets sticky. So then the moment you start saying, that person did that to you once. Yeah, that person, I had a similar experience. That person did that to me. Now, now we open the door like, I'm going to use you mm -hmm. to reaffirm my attachment to that emotion. Mm -hmm. And let's just work it up so that you can suffer and I can suffer and then we can have a conversation. And literally, we're sharing the same energy. And if we're sharing the same energy, we're sharing the same information. And we're bound by an invisible field of energy that keeps us connected. Yes. So then what does it take to break that energetic field? An energy that's greater than the energy that's holding it together. That's how you separate atoms that become a molecule. You, they're, they're bound by an invisible field of energy that's keeping them connected. So you got to use a greater energy than the energy that's holding them together to separate them. Well, in order for you to change then, you can't have energy without awareness or consciousness. You got to go to a greater level of consciousness and change your energy. And nobody changes, Jay, until they change their energy. And when they change their energy, they change their life. So then you may say, well, this person, you know, I, I use this person and I use my enemy to reaffirm my addiction to hatred. I use my coworker to reaffirm my addiction to judgment. I use my ex to reaffirm my uh, uh, addiction to resentment. That we have these different people in our lives that we need to remind us of who we think we are. The enemy dies and you find another one. Mm. You, know, you know, your coworker uh, leaves and you start judging another one. It's just... It's not any, it's not that. So then when there's no longer a vibrational match, when you start doing the work, there's no longer a vibrational match with you and your past, present reality, that, that person or that condition any longer. That person or condition is going to spiral away because you're no longer, you're no longer in need of that. So then uh, our life begins to change when we change our energy and, and we begin to take our power back that's essential for us to begin to create with. Now, some people can't handle that because they're not conscious that they're doing it. So they'll be working on their vision of the future, and yet they'll spend two hours lowering their energy back into victimization or suffering, and they want to know why their future isn't happening. Well, there's an unconscious program. Let's go after that. And once you start going after that, now, all of a sudden, your life starts to change again. So you can't say it doesn't work. On some level, we don't work. And if you're really invested in this, the question is, what is it about me? Where am I directing my attention or my energy? Who am I using to reaffirm some conditioning that I need to remember as my old self? So then when you stop reacting to the person or the person's now complaining to you and you're not complaining back, it's going to be an uncomfortable moment because you're all of a sudden seeing a part of you you used to be that you no longer are and you have to be willing to not go there and over time that person will thank you and they'll say i didn't even know that i was complaining that much and by changing yourself you help others you know it just that's how it works yeah absolutely and, and and i think that's the painful reality of a lot of what you're saying is you you know that point you made about it doesn't work well actually we're not working yeah like we're not working towards it our proportions of future versus past mm -hmm. are totally off right and so we want our future to grow but we spend 50 percent less time on it than we do still in that past programming right and and i think that's kind of like the hardest pill to swallow it is it is it's like the most painful one. but look look what, what how bad does it have to get i mean to what denominator to what lowest level do you have to reach before people really make up their mind to change my message is why wait i mean yeah. when you're feeling so altered emotionally you feel so bad that's the moment you could actually see yourself for the first time because you're you're not you're answering your cell phone you're not responding to all your texts you're not watching tv you're not going out to dinners you're not calling people back you're something's altered in you and you're starting to become self-aware right so then people wait to that lowest moment where they can start to see themselves through the eyes of somebody else. Well, if you're waking up every day and you're combining a clear intention with an elevated emotion and you're changing your emotional state to be 
elevated. You could still see the old self from an elevated point of view and be stay conscious than from a limited point of view. And that's what I want for people. Like, let's go. I mean, what do you got to lose? What, people are going to start wondering, like, did you change your medication? <laughs> What's up with that guy? Something's different about him. You're not predictable any longer, right? And we say to our, our, our community, you know, when you're changing, you just stop talking about it. Yeah. You're just too busy being it. Something's happening, you know, and that's the repetition of getting a few days in a row of that really well. I always say, God, if you had a great meditation, you wake up feeling better at the end of that meditation than when you started, and you do that the next day, and then the next day, you're going to start feeling better all the time. And that your body's going to start feeling better and everything's going to start feeling better. And you're going to start feeling better about life. So then we have a thousand reasons. I have more than a thousand reasons every day to be unhappy with managing companies and staff and people, all that. But, but then when you rise above that and you choose just who you want to be, uh, I think it makes a big impression uh, on, your, on your family, first yourself, your family and your friends and the people you work with and then finally the, our communities. So I think that people are starting to figure that out. They're, and, and when they imagine oxytocin levels in our student body, the love hormone, the love chemical, 200 times outside of normal. The latest research on oxytocin, a slight, slight elevation on oxytocin, it's impossible to hold a grudge. Now, so then what that means is you feel so amazing that why would you want to hold a grudge against that person? So forgiveness then is not something that you have to try to do to be spiritual. It's the side effect of saying, I don't want to give up this feeling for you or anybody, so I'm letting it go. I'm freeing you. I'm freeing myself. And my goodness, there's more liberation of energy. I call that the natural state of being. And we're knocking on that door. Why? Because as you begin to open your heart to life again, and you start trusting in your future and trusting in yourself a little bit more, and you start self-regulating with your heart, you do that properly, and you lead from that place, from that level of awareness, your life will change in dramatic ways. And why is that essential? Because when people start doing that effectively, oxytocin signals nitric oxide. Nitric oxide signals a chemical called endothelial-derived relaxing factor. And that causes the arteries in your heart and lungs, Jay, to literally swell. Just like when, you're, when your sexual organs are aroused and blood flow moves into them, male and female, that's a different consciousness. There's a different energy in there. Imagine the same intensity moving into your heart. That's what people are experiencing. That is a level of love. It's not like a love for your puppy. It's not like the love for your partner. This is transcendent of that. This is the most familiar, unfamiliar feeling you will ever have. It'll be distant and at the same time very close. And you'll start to see the hidden meaning behind all things. And now, when you walk in the presence of your greatest betrayer, the person who threw you under the bus, whatever it is, when you walk in from this place, there will be no emotional reaction. You will just see that person for who they are, who you used to be. Now, compassion then is no longer something that you have to try to do. It's the end product of doing the work. And, and I think that mystics and saints and uh, masters of old understood this. So when they thought of that person, they didn't allow that thought to produce a feeling or an energy that would lower their energy. They understood that when they had the thought of that person, they saw their limitation. It wasn't hurting them. It was only hurting themselves. Now, I think that if the world was doing that, wow, we'd have a very different world. Yeah, I love that point. That's such a phenomenal point. Joe, you've been incredible. Like, um, really love this conversation. We end every On Purpose episode with a final five. Uh, this is kind of like a quick fire, rapid fire round. Right. But uh, before we dive into that, I just wanted to... Uh, just just take that point that you just ended on there. I think that's the big one, right? Like what you've just said for me, that's the big one. It's the recognition that when you're assimilating a negative thought or a negative judgment or a negative emotion, envy, greed, whatever it may be, that's actually lowering your energy. Yeah. And when you get to that place where you're experiencing that incredible bliss right here, you can't. 
you can't yeah and even if you have the thought the thought will still come because we still have those thoughts but the thought yeah. will be an understanding Correct. of human nature because you're no longer it at that vibrational level any yeah. longer you're rising above it you know and and i think more and more people are starting to figure that out and 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 the people in their lives are like no my husband <laughs> My husband is a changed person. No, he's not the same guy. I know him. I know he's completely different. And the guy's just like, "Yeah, I feel amazing. I feel great." <laughs> and all it was was sitting in the fire. Yes. For a little bit of time until the body finally moved out of the past into the present moment. And so the causes of this, like I always say, you never know what you're doing today and how you're doing it, who you're going to affect tomorrow when you do this work. And that's what we're seeing. People are they they they're getting promotions uh they're getting all these wonderful things not because of anything that they're doing mm. they're just different yeah. and people notice that and they want those people yeah. in the position to make better decisions for the whole and i and i think that's uh that's how we change the world absolutely i love it so here's your final five jo the first okay. question is what are the three things we should say when we wake up in the morning or we'll think huh. <laughs> Well, first I would say what is the greatest ideal of myself that I can be today? And I would not get up until I felt like that person. The second thing I would say is can I begin to keep my energy up the entire day and if I do it properly, then I will be open to opportunities and possibilities that weren't there before. The last thing I would say is could I sustain brain and heart coherence to the point where that intelligence within me that's giving me life begins to find a door to open out so i can begin to see evidence in my world i love that beautiful question 2 what would you say every evening before you go to sleep oh yeah how what did i do today thing, how did i do how did i do how did i do today how, yeah. i mean one day one lifetime yeah. how did i do today yeah. did i change or help another human being did i really change someone's future future timeline mm -hmm. lastly what is the greatest thing i learned i love that question number 3 of the final five three things to remove from our vocabulary i can't uh is probably one of the biggest ones i'll do it later or i'll do it tomorrow is also uh another big one and um uh it's too hard oh yeah nice i like those three mine uh i switch saying i'm busy to being productive that changed my life just mm. just recognizing the difference between what busy made me feel and what productive made me feel and The other ones were in arguments, stopping saying you never and you always, because no one never does anything and no one always does something, and we say those all the time. Okay, uh, question number four: uh, What's your meditation practice like? Wow, wow, I'm wow. I do a very uh, advanced version of uh, what uh, my books uh, are about, just because uh, mm -hmm. I'm always trying new things out yeah. for for our community. Uh, but you know my big thing really lately is the mystical mm. and um i just had one of the most transcendental experiences this particular weekend uh, uh so um i go as deep as i possibly can into that fertile blackness and uh well, i don't stop until i connect to something and i know when i that feeling it what it is when i connect and then i i have a thought of whatever experience i want and then i completely surrender uh to the outcome and stay open and uh it's been working pretty well that's amazing and question number 5 if you could give everyone in the world an experiment to do for 30 days oh. one activity that they'd have to do every day for 30 days what would it be oh i would ask them to take out a piece of paper and write down every thought that they've been thinking that's standing in the way between their future and and where they are to write down every habit or behavior even how they speak that stops them from becoming the person that is healthy wealthy or free and then to begin to uh recognize the emotions that keep them in the same state of being every single day and become so conscious of those thoughts behaviors and emotions that they wouldn't let any of them slip by unnoticed by them then i would have them write down the thoughts they do on a fire and wire in their brain i would have them write down what the behaviors look like of a great person that they wanted to become 
And I would have them practice thinking about it and practice rehearsing it. And then I would say to them, what emotions would you feel when your future happened? Because you have to teach your body emotionally what that future feels like before it happens. And every day, if you practice that diligently and sincerely, and just become conscious of who you no longer want to be and keep becoming conscious of who do you do want to be, you should begin to see evidence in your life. And when it comes in a way that you least expect, that surprises you and leaves no doubt that it's come from a greater mind, then you'll be inspired to do it again. And now we believe we're more the creators of our lives and less of the victims of our lives.